We've been working with micromobility companies since 2017. We've helped them scale in as short as three months and help them scale into the tens of thousands of units. My role as a solutions architect is to guide customers through product development and take advantage of Particle's hardware, connectivity, and cloud platform. We've learned a ton helping our customers scale. There are many learnings that we've learned along the way. And today, I'm going to focus on three target areas. Building your vehicle and focusing on the connectivity. Deploying firmware over the air and how do you do that at scale. And then once you've deployed your fleet at scale, how do you actually operate it efficiently? We'll start with connectivity. Navigating the global cellular connectivity space is already widely complex, with carriers communicating different pieces of information, networks getting sunset, new technologies getting introduced. And on top of that, for those of us that are focused in the micromobility of a space, it gets even more complex. Connectivity providers are incentivized to focus on early adoption. But with technologies like 5G, are they really relevant for us when we're deploying at scale? Taking a look at 5G, it doesn't always make sense for those of us that are deployed in cities. The reason being 5G is really intended for short range transmissions between a tower and your edge device, high bandwidth streams where you're streaming AR into your face, And these 5G networks are intended for stationary devices. Think at a football stadium, streaming thousands of devices to the internet. It doesn't always make sense for micromobility because of these constraints. Maybe one day, when we have our self-driving scooters and the networks are deployed, we'll be able to take advantage of it. Let's look at a technology that some of us are more familiar with and that's more mature in the IoT space. 2G and 3G are technologies that have been around for decades. The networks themselves are extremely mature. Carriers have those partnerships across the globe. The modules themselves to integrate with are relatively small in size. The power consumption is relatively low with transmissions only consuming sometimes a few watts, and the cost being extremely low as well. In terms of coverage, in the United States, we've sunsetted much of 2G and 3G, but in the rest of the world, in Europe, for example, the 2G networks are still up, and this has been mandated by the government where there are medical devices and emergency service vehicles that are still running on these 2G GSM networks. In addition, there are some carriers and countries that have chosen to have no plan to sunset 2G and 3G. Though the downside with 2G is that at some point it could sunset, and the power consumption of those of some of its cousins is much larger and the time that it connects to a 2G network will take longer than an LTE network. Let's look at connectivity that's designed for IoT. In particular, LTE CAT M1 and narrowband IoT are both designed with IoT in mind. With North America primarily betting on LTE CAT M1 and Europe and Asia betting on NB IoT, we have a really unique landscape. Focusing on LTE CAT M1, the modules themselves are similar in size to 2G and 3G modules. The cost is actually less than 2G and 3G modules. And the power consumption is even lower. We're recommending, if you're deploying your IoT assets inside North America, that you can take advantage of LTE CAT M1. 
In terms of NB-IoT, it's a non-starter for micromobility. The reason it's a non-starter for micromobility is that NB-IoT expects that devices live on one tower. There is no such thing as handoff in NB-IoT. So being able to have a vehicle move between cell towers is not part of the spec. Maybe in a later, later version of NB-IoT this will be true, but in the current implementation, it's not. The other challenge with NB-IoT is that carriers deploy their networks in their own ways, and you won't be able to roam between networks. This is because each carrier has chosen to implement the entire infrastructure from the ground up differently. Let's look at a technology we're all familiar with that's in our pockets. LTE, in particular for micromobility, LTE Cat 1, is a technology that's available today. Those carrier relationships exist worldwide. But there are some drawbacks to LTE Cat 1 and above. In particular, the cost of these modules is 2 to 3x those of the LTE Cat M1 modules or even 2G and 3G modules. The modules themselves are sometimes 2 to 3x as large and the power consumption is even greater. If your application and your business can accommodate these caveats and you're driven by having a single SKU, LTE is a great way to deploy an IoT solution. So what is the takeaway from deploying connectivity in the micromobility space with what's available? In terms of LTE Cat 1, it's the most relevant having coverage worldwide. Those carrier relationships exist. I'm sure when many of you traveled from your home country to here, you were roaming now from your home country onto what's available in Germany. But with the drawbacks being the size of the module, cost, and power. LTE Cat M1 is incredibly powerful because it supports mobile handoff and really is a subset off of LTE. If you're deploying your assets today in North America or Australia, it's definitely something to consider. NB-IoT, while some carriers may pitch extremely low cost and low power, is largely an untested deployment and will require you to be locked into a carrier. And 2G being the most relevant, being the most mature technology, with Europe and Asia maintaining those 2G networks. The downside being that the technology doesn't include the latest power saving techniques that we've implemented in LTE, and that at some point these technologies could get sunset. We recommend deploying on 2G in places like Europe. One interesting thing about this space is many module vendors actually use a combination of an LTE Cat 1 and a 2G module so that customers are able to deploy in both North America and in Europe using the same SKU. So now that we've talked about how we're going to connect our devices, we want to talk about how we're going to deploy over-the-air firmware updates to these devices. I'm sure many of you have heard of OTA. And for many of us that are familiar with the space, it feels like table stakes. But those of us that want to differentiate from the pack and be able to operate at scale, you'll need to leverage a flexible OTA practice that will both give you a market differentiation and improve your user experience. So what is OTA? Performing an OTA is no different than what you find on your cell phone where you're delivered new updates to your phone's operating system and software. When you have the device in your hand, it's an easy experience. If there are any issues, you can pause it, reset the device. But now you have your devices in the hands of your consumers. They need to behave differently. They need to behave safely. How can we do this? By taking advantage of technologies such as 
an intelligent OTA where the actual vehicle is aware of what its life cycle is. Am I parked? Is somebody riding me? And being able to say, hey, I'm not ready to accept an update. I will accept it later. These are critical technologies to have implemented into your OTA practice in order to roll out updates safely. This should be automatic and not manual. These updates should be deployed into your fleet in the matter of hours rather than days or months due to technicians having to manually update these devices. Say you're deploying in a new city. You've had your devices in the area for a while, and now there's a regulation that says, I need to change the speed. Instead of rolling out a firmware update to all of your devices in your fleet, taking advantage of a critical technology like device groupings and being able to take subsets of your fleet and slice them up, you'll be able to do things like take one part of the city and roll a new firmware update just to limit the speed. In addition, if you want to try new features, such as trying a new anti-theft system, you're able to actually deploy this firmware over the air to a specific group of devices and be able to test features to be able to expand your business value. The other thing that's critical about deploying OTA is actually having a resilient and reliable system. When teams started deploying updates over the air, it was this really awkward and scary process where you would push firmware over the air, down to your devices, cross your fingers, wait for the device to reset, and hope that it comes back online. This practice is detrimental when you're in the tens of thousands of devices. And so having a technology built into your OTA where when you deploy updates down to your device, they're able to intelligently update themselves, load that new application firmware, check to make sure they're OK, and if not, be able to roll back to a stable version. Having these practices where you have an intelligent OTA, where your devices are aware of themselves and able to update their firmware appropriately when they're ready, being able to have groups of devices and subsets in your fleet to roll firmware to will be incredibly valuable using device groups. And having a resilient OTA that's intelligent and can roll back will save your team time and money. So now we've talked about how to deploy firmware updates over the air and what OTA looks like. Let's talk about actually how do we operate a fleet at scale. So now that you're global and you're operating in multiple cities and you have thousands of devices out there, how do we take advantage of this fleet? In order to scale efficiently, we really have found that you need to be able to extend the life of your fleet and reduce the operational cost. But how can we take advantage of this? How can we actually execute? By using tools like a 10,000 foot view with something like a fleet health, you're able to get a view of your entire fleet. These fleets themselves are not something you can deploy and not look at ever again. They'll need constant monitoring and attention. Having key health indicators letting you know when devices are online, when devices are poorly misbehaving, and being able to actually tactically delegate resources to them. Having this constant monitoring and near-time data will be critical in preventing your engineers from going off into a corner and searching for a needle in a haystack and cloud logs. One of our customers began their deployment in Southern California. Using tools like Fleet Health, they were able to identify all of a sudden a particular part of their fleet had gone offline. We were able to identify with them that a carrier had misconfigured a tower in an area. There's no other time 
when a micromobility company is able to find problems in a telco infrastructure than today. So you've got your 10,000 foot view. But what's critical is having actionable insights through having device diagnostics. Being able to, at every layer of the stack, identify where issues are occurring. Starting at the cloud layer, navigating down into the telco connectivity layer, and seeing down into the device layer. Having this vertical visibility will be critical in identifying when devices are misbehaving and why. The last part that will really be valuable to your fleet at scale will be dealing with provisioning. Many of our customers need to have a way to add devices into a fleet, remove them from a fleet, and refurbish them. Whether you're deploying in a new city, or you've just moved away from a customer, or you're pulling devices out of a fleet, you'll need to have a flexible way to move your devices in your fleet between customers and out of service. Sometimes there's even a business issue where you either need to decommission the entire fleet or be able to re-enable that fleet within a matter of hours. Because the time that you're up and operating is money. What we found is that sometimes, if you don't have a unique provisioning system, you're stuck with manually decommissioning these devices. Or in some cases, vendors requiring a minimum order quantity in order to change customers for you. So what did we learn about in terms of operating a fleet at scale? Is that fleet health will be critical to get that 10,000 foot view. Having actionable device diagnostics of seeing from the cloud layer all the way down into your device and having a unique and flexible provisioning system so that you can move devices between customers and also get them in and out of service appropriately. Ultimately, the teams that separate themselves from the pack will be those that integrate flexible fleet technologies. So we've looked at what is important for operating these fleets. Selecting the right connectivity will be critical whether it's LTE CAT M1 or 2G. Being able to leverage an OTA practice at scale. Deploying new firmware intelligently, having device groups. And being able to operate your fleet at scale efficiently through reduced costs with actionable data to extend the life of your fleet. Whether you're starting your fleet for the first time or you're expanding your business, we hope these insights that we've learned from our customers, our customers will help you scale and be successful in your business. Thank you.